was done a long time ago, and I thought maybe Chuck had it, not us. Roll tape. Uh, you've done inspired and progressive versions and or progressive versions of Satisfaction, Secret Agent Man, and Working in a Coal Mine. Uh, and are you experienced? Can you explain to me why you did those particular songs? Satisfaction. You know, in the, in, well, in the context of Devo as it relates to any kind of broad approach to, to progressive music, I suppose when all the dust clears and, and we're in our uh, Jarvik 7s and we're 60 years old and mutants affected by some un yet, yet unnamed environmental disease, we'll, we'll be talking about, uh, if we can talk, we'll be talking about or remembering, be remembered by the uh, covers we've done uh, other than the music videos we've done, we'll be remembered for some of those, but we'll be remembered for the covers we've done, which seems to clue everybody in on the kind of style of music that Devo added to the scene because they're reference or starting points, and you can see the difference between the originals and then what Devo did to them 20 years later. So like when, when we did the music to Satisfaction, everybody still brings that one up as they did at the time is something that they, you know, definitely hold as, as some kind of hallmark of mutation or something. And we played it for Mick Jagger. Uh, Mark put it on a reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder in um, Peter Rudge's office in New York City, and Mick was in town, and we had to play it for him to get permission to put it on the record. And for about 30 seconds, it looked bad. And then he, uh, he, he started staring at Mark, and Mark stared back at him, and pretty soon he jumped out of his chair, and he kept looking at Mark, and he had a drink in his hand, and he started dancing around, some bizarre kind of English sky dance with hopping to the backbeat up like a chicken on one foot. And uh, we, were <laughs> we were relieved and amused, <laughs> and we were glad. And I'm sure he was glad because he thought it might sell four or 500,000 copies, and it wouldn't be any skin off of his uh, yodeler yodeler that's what I was looking for what I do what do you call that uh, he's, such a, he's such a rooster what do you call it oh well the Cox crawl <laughs> secret agent man Mark tell him about secret agent man Mark came up with that bizarre lick Secret Agent Man was just one of the songs uh, that we were always impressed with, and it was uh, it was you know the middle of the '70s when we you know late middle '70s when we first did that one as a band, so it was appropriate, uh, you know, appropriate lyrics and uh, twisted it, that one up. It was uh, it was actually the recording that uh, was done in 1975 that was used in. The beginning was the end, our first videotape, along with Jocko Homo. It starts with a real Chinese computer rock and roll version of uh, Secret Agent Man done on a four-track machine with a prototype of electronic drums built by Mark's brother, Jim Mothersbaugh, and he developed them himself. He was, he was into this really early on, a real pioneer. He works for Roland now. And uh, he, he's standing up drumming. I think you're going to see it. Uh, we're going to run a clip or something. You'll see this version of Secret Agent Man at least about 90 seconds. And uh, those drums are really working drums that you're going to see in the shot. Now, um, give me a little bit on working in a coal mine, I guess, and a little bit about the heavy metal. So I'll, just somebody can say working in a coal mine. Working in a coal mine, which we still are. Uh, that, the reason that song came up on the heavy metal soundtrack album is because we had done it to please ourselves uh, uh, in, in, in some rehearsals that we were doing for the Freedom of Choice album and for the tour. And our manager heard it and really liked it a lot. And we'd always liked it anyway and hadn't put it on the record and weren't going to put it on the record, rather. And so we, we let um, Irving Azoff use it as part of the soundtrack album to heavy metal. We thought that was a funny idea because uh, the song was anything but a heavy metal song. And we liked the idea of having a non, 
a metal song in the middle of this album that was all, you know, supposedly going to be, you know, Ronnie Dio and... But believe me, those pickaxes and those shovels that we had to use to get those sounds on the tape are, are heavier than every, any heavy metal guitar. Than any axe, yes. Than any axe. Just ask me. How about our experience? Hang on one second. I'm hearing something. What if that's off? Will that uh, not bother anyone? Do we have to start over at the beginning? Uh? Okay, first question. <laughs> the reason we did Are You Experienced, um, I mean, aside from, uh, oh. Oh. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. uh, the reason. I do want to change this. Drum roll. <laughs> The reason we did Are You Experienced, I mean, aside from, from uh, liking that, hey, I wonder what they're doing. Stool scoot. Well, let it run. I mean, if you, you know, uh, for, you, for the viewers out there, if you're hearing any noise on the soundtrack, it's because our studio is adjacent to Modern Props, a famous prop rental house in LA that made this globe that you see behind you for Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, and they've done many feature films, and Which they happen be to be out. friends of ours. The movie, The uh, <laughs> Wrath of Khan, will be out soon. <laughs> okay. So wait in line. Sure. It's a well-deserved plug for modern mm -hmm. props, however. But the reason we did Are You Experienced, aside from liking Jimi Hendrix quite a bit, is uh, that that's not since Satisfaction has a song been so important to, to the uh, whole history of music, or pop music, because with satisfaction, while that's like a public statement, and that was a new visual style, a new set of sounds, and, and one man's ran against uh, a sterile society, Hendrix's Are You Experienced was the, probably the most important song of the whole internal exploration that, uh, that the hippies in the psychedelic 60s uh, took off with, and Hendrix is this is the singular most important figure to us of the whole period and highly underrated and a prototype of everything that came after and everything that's highly, highly imitated of, of, of Hendrix. And people have been taking bits and chunks of him ever since, not the least of which is Prince, who does a good job. But anyway, we did that because that song is so important and so special in, in, in as unique a way as Satisfaction was special. And uh, we, only, we only like to tackle the big ones Can we get your autograph after the interview? That was a great band. Oh, Randy California's father was a drummer. He's the only guy that wanted a set of drums. <laughs> 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 well, let's see. Oh, okay, this is a good question. Um, this is about you work with synthesizers and the textures of electronic sound. Everybody has spoken about the, the, the innovative and exciting ways that you use the instruments. Why did you decide to use synthesizers in the beginning or make that a, you know, your, your database for your music? Well, uh, we were experimenting. Uh, actually, what happened is, actually, what happened? Let me tell you how we started using synthesizers in our band and got into what we do. Uh, when I want to know, when Jerry and I first met, we were at school and he played bass and he was playing in blues bands, kind of, not blues bands, but blues music. He was experimenting with, with all, you know, blues music, and I, I was Captain Beefheart. Yeah, 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 the old blues stuff. And he and I was experimenting with electronics, with tape recorders, and and uh, homemade noise making devices. And Devo kind of came of putting those things together. And then, you know, when you tried to make the same thing happen twice on stage for the same song two nights in a row. Uh, you found out you had to have something a little more sophisticated than just, you know, two wires. Patch cords. <laughs> a patch cord, and, you know, something that really was literally patched. And so uh, we went to polyphonic synthesizers. And then, then one thing led to another. It was, it was horrible. It was hell after that. True hell. True hell. Synthesizer hell. Because synthesizers, it would seem, would... would uh, obviously take a creative person's uh, abilities and expand them because they give them a wider range of, 
of sounds, just like a bigger palette or something, and you could go further and more, be more creative and go more unique and in different directions. And just because they take over because of what they are, the trade-off that sometimes is worse than a 50-50 trade-off is that you are then completely dictated to by the crudeness of the technology. Yeah, kids, it's a one-way <laughs> street. So just stay the hell away if you can. You start off with a mini mug and pretty soon you're up to a fair light. We're talking big bucks. You're up, right, you're up to three hard disks a day. As time goes on, when we think about working with Brian Eno, we like it better and better. <laughs> At the time, it was very strange. I mean, it, it came about because we were supposed to work with David Bowie, and then he couldn't because he did Just a Gigolo. That's, that's what he was signed to do at that time in 1978. And uh, we were already well down the road with arrangements and plans and an agreement to record in Germany. And David said, OK, how about doing it with Brian? If you can't wait any longer, Brian Eno. And that sounded incredible to us. So we met with Brian in New York and said, OK. And we went to Germany and started working with him. And of course, our styles were much different. The, the musical language was much different. And I don't just mean, I don't mean musical styles. I mean styles of working and speaking and being. And he was dealing with some hardcore spud American um, devolved radicals, and we were dealing with a, a, an esoteric Englishman. And I do like the, the result now that there's been years to reflect on it, but of course at the time there was a lot of friction and a lot of dissent and just a lot of maybe not arguing but, but just missing each other like non sequiturs. He would get out his deck of cards, his, uh, what were they called? The, uh, Oblique strategy. Oblique strategy deck of cards that was supposed to take your mind off your work and thereby make your mind more on your work. He was a, a regular Zenite. And uh, anyway. Well, we, we suffered during that on the recording, <laughs> too, because it would, uh, he, he did misrepresent the, uh, the local people. Uh, of the area of Germany we were in. We found ourselves out in the middle of nowhere. and <laughs> He thought that'd be good for us. <laughs> he thought it'd be good, and we were celibate for the longest period of time we'd ever been since we were in... Four. In <laughs> elementary school. Since before we went to uh, that elementary school over there. Since his mom closed her garage door to him. That's right. But anyway, Brian's great. <laughs> and we really, we'd, we'd like to work with Brian again. I wish we could. And, we just heard uh, the, the piece he did for Dune. He did a song called Prophecy for Dune, and it's the only good piece of music in the, in the film, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, uh, not to mention the stuff from Toto. If you can't say anything good, don't say anything at all. But um, Brian uh, apparently worked with U2 on their last album. Is that correct? Off Camera Man? Yeah. And I, I really like uh, what I'm hearing there, so. You know, he's as a producer, he's he's great. Um, discuss your a little bit. Let's get into a little bit of discussion about touring, uh, about the actual, a little bit about some of the some of the more interesting tours you've done. And, and it's got here in parentheses new traditionalists with treadmill and sets. So if you want to use that as a the New Traditionalist Tour was probably, while it wasn't technically the most state-of-the-art, it was the most elaborate and crowd-pleasing for some reason. We had a fast food Parthenon built. And I say fast food because it's built uh, on an aluminum superstructure that then was uh, uh, shielded with a facade of uh, translucent plexiglass columns and a frieze, a temple-like frieze and a platform. And it was all backlit, so this, this structure, this three-dimensional structure was about 10 feet high and went to about 15 feet at the apex of the freeze and it was about three feet deep and 12 foot long uh, conveyor belt treadmills came out of each of the um, sets of coving that was created by the four columns. There were three coves. The treadmills came out to the front of the stage and delivered us to our instruments and took us back again and, re and went at various speeds in addition to 
backwards and forwards. And then uh, the whole temple was, was um, hooked to sequencers and chase patterns off of a Kliegel computer. And the, the, so the columns chased up and down and, you know, like a carnival and, and, and sideways across the stage to the music and changed color. And it really looked like you could go order falafel and baklava, you know, at some point and uh, high-tech car hops would, you know, would serve you in uh, clear plastic bikinis, maybe. I mean, in my mind, in, in my mind. Well, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, it was, it was very elaborate and well choreographed and staged and developed because then the whole fast food Parthenon was stripped apart to reveal this metallic um, scaffolding superstructure that kind of, uh, I don't know, it was pure. It just resembled like some kind of set like Jailhouse Rock or something like that, but 20 years later. And Mark worked off of a 10-foot high platform off of ladders that came up the back. And we worked down underneath in the coving with rear projection screens. Serving was, falafels. Serving the falafels. Stretched rear projection screens were stretched behind us. And three big Buell projectors projected images like decaying vegetable matter, um, um, French decorative book papers, um, international no smoking and no violence and no Christianity graphics and uh, good clean re-education images. Yeah, that related to the songs. And this was all engineered with a development both visually and speed wise in the music and everything and it lasted about two hours with an encore of working in a coal mine where we were Mark and I were up on the uh, platform lowering pulleys and buckets down onto the guys on the uh, treadmills who were working endless, endlessly, like R. Crumb's characters who go off into the sunset where it says it's the end except for these guys. They were working just infinitely. Well, loading the panties and the, yeah. and the potato caps that had been tossed onto the stage by the audience. In buckets, and we'd take them up onto the platform. The whole thing was being performed in um, reams and reams of uh, stage smoke, theatrical fog. Uh-oh, it's, it's my mother.